Hello everybody. Welcome again to yet another edition of uh, the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour in Con. You know I talk about uh, the eternal return and the eternal recurrence. I think a lot of you probably feel that that is the same when I start everything with exactly the same introduction and I do this every time. And every time I start saying I keep thinking oh for God's sake don't say that, say something different, say anything you know, sing a song, but don't get boring. Um, but we're hoping that these uh, little vignettes that we do are two hour vignettes that have become uh, quite popular at the moment, are quite surprisingly popular. Uh, and we're getting larger and larger numbers of people joining us, which is really, really great. And I'd like to think that we're getting quite a reputation as being one of the most intellectually interesting and intellectually challenging podcasts um, on YouTube. And today will be no exception. Again, we have a returning guest from my in uh, from my Consciousness Hour shows. This is uh, Dr. Neil Rushton, and Neil and I did a, a fascinating show last year. I think it was with um, um, with sadly the the um, my assistant uh, Dia Nunez, who sadly is no longer with us. Uh, rest in peace, dear, wherever you are, and I hope you're looking down at us and uh, and everything else. We, we do miss you terribly, um, and. It was a wonderful show, and like most of the shows that we do, you just felt that we really had only scratched the surface. Um, and now this is why I've created the whole InCon idea. Now, just to explain what we mean by InCon, it's in conversation, it is completely informal, and it's a three-way discussion between myself, my wonderful producer, Sarah James, and our guests. Um, usually it's quite difficult for us to actually bring in any of you guys that are listening in, or watching, but we do, Sarah keeps a close eye, as I do, on the um, responses we're getting in the in the chat in the chat area as well. So if sometimes it lo I look as if I'm being ill mannered, and I noticed this in the last video that I uploaded onto my uh, YouTube channel, is that I will be looking away when the person's talking, and this is purely simply because I'm not aware I'm on camera, um, and I'm just checking the feed to see if there's any any snippets of interest or things I want to say. So it doesn't mean I'm not listening to our guest. I am because they are always enthralling and always fascinating. So one thing that was delight delightful about talking to Neil is that um, Neil lives in the area that is my home area of the Wirral upon the northwest of England, or technically the Wirral Peninsula, um, one of these areas that people always call incorrectly the, the Wirral, uh, and it should be the Wirral Peninsula or just Wirral, uh, one of the two. Um, again, it was a place that... Um, is a lovely place to live, quite fascinating, and I have lots of friends that are still up there, and I know that there will be a lot of people from Wirral listening in here as well, which is really good, so great to talk to you guys. So, Neil, how are things over there in Wallasey? Hello, Anthony, and hello, Sarah. Yeah, really great to be back on. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful sunny day in the Wirral. Sorry, the Wirral. <laughs> uh, I've actually learned something. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually realise, you know, how you're supposed to pronounce it. But uh, yeah, no, I've lived here for almost three years now and um, yeah, enjoying it most of the time, although it would be nice if we weren't locked down in, in the world. I have to admit. You haven't acquired the accent yet, which is um, you, probably uh, useful. Uh, I, I work hard on not acquiring the accent. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I don't mind. I've always used it in the in the years gone by. I've always reverted back to type when I need to because the the Merseyside accent, probably after the Glaswegian accent, is probably the most aggressive and threatening accent you can have. So it well, does. Well, it can be. When, when I first moved here, although my family is from Liverpool, so you know I know Liverpool quite well. Um, uh, but when I moved here, and you know start going for walks, the first thing I, I noticed was why are you so loud. <laughs> well, what, what what are you shouting about? But they're not shouting. It's just normal rural behaviour. And of course, after a few months, you just take it for granted. I, I, and I probably now, when I when I'm out and about, if I'm talking to someone, I'm doing exactly the same thing. But that was that was that was one little culture shock that I got. When I, yeah, they do, don't they? I mean, they used to used to be the running joke, didn't they, on um, Brookside? when they used to do the spoof, when Harry Enfield used to do the Scousers with the moustaches and shouting, and uh, we do do that. <laughs> and we all did have a thing about having moustaches as well. I had a moustache for years, you know. It's, it's just one of the things we do. It's it's probably the Irish Welsh in us, you know, that, that makes us slightly different to everybody else. Um, you have the yeah. shell suit, though, Anthony. I didn't have the shell suit. No, that's most unfortunate. I never went, quite got into the shell suit image, I have to say. I think I felt that I'd be rustling too much, you know. <laughs> just kind of, and it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily go down well in the, the, the leafy, leafy areas of West Sussex, really, a shell suit. No. Maybe, maybe. Okay, Neil, well, let's, without further ado, 
uh, because this is an informal chat and everything else, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know we discussed about the background to you last time, but we've got much more time now to just go into much more detail. So can you just tell us a little bit about what makes you tick and indeed what it is and how you experienced Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is the subject that we're going to be talking about today. So a little bit of background. Who is Neil Rushton? And well, just tell us more about yourself. Who is Neil Rushton? Um, well, yeah, it, it it may surprise some um, some people to have for me to be an archaeologist on here talking about altered states of consciousness, states of consciousness, Charles Bonnet sy syndrome, egregorials, etc. But it's um, it's been it's been quite a long trip to get here. Uh, no pun intended. Um, I so, so well. I'll ju just give you my background, where I came from. I actually, I actually left school at sixteen and um, went to work for um, a, a sort of graphic de design company, um, and which I hated. It was, it was. I should never have left school at sixteen. I could have gone on to college, but at the time, you know what you like when you're sixteen. It's just I want to earn some money and. Um, get out and, and, and do, do, do whatever you do when you're 16. Um, so it took me um, about seven years. Um, uh, so, so we're talking about the early 90s here. Um, uh, and in 1993, I, I'd had enough of it. And I just, I, I just quit. I took the redundancy. And by that time, I'd already started to really get into history and archaeology, you know, watch it on the TV, read, reading the sort of general textbooks, um, uh, that, that sort of thing. So I decided to go along to um, a volunteer excavation, um, as you could do in 1993. If, if you go along to a volunteer excavation now, you'd have to pay quite a lot of money for, for the privilege, whereas then, uh, some of the local archaeology, not the unit, not necessarily the units, but the um, uh, the amateur groups were carrying out excavations in a way they don't tend to do now. So I went along to uh, a dig being carried out by uh, an organisation called the Avon Valley Archaeological Society in the New Forest. It was, it was actually a Romano-British site. Um, and... Uh, but, it, but it was it was a bit chaotic and after two days of not really knowing what i was doing or or uh, amongst all these people it wasn't any sort of real training they called in uh, a guy called chris curry who was an archaeologist and by then he was already an established archaeologist and they brought him in to basically direct it because it was getting a little bit out of control and chris um i, I was I, I will never forget this I was digging a post hole. Um, Non-archaeologists may not know that, uh, you know, post holes are pretty important in terms of evidence. Post hole, if you get timber frame building, um, you'll have a post hole into the to the natural natural earth in the trench, um, uh, which can get dating evidence from even environmental evidence and, and this kind of thing. And I, I, I'd been set the task of excavating the post hole, but I didn't know what I was doing. So there I am scraping away the trail thinking, my goodness, I have no idea what I'm doing. Chris came along, fortunately, just at that time, went around the site, came up, realised what I was doing. And within 10 minutes, he'd shown me what a post hole is, why it's so important and how you excavate it um, in his very clear and concise way. But Chris was quite an eccentric. And within after that 10 minutes, um, the next half an hour, uh, consisted of myself and him talking about progressive rock music from the early 1970s. Wow. Um, which I just got into, and he had been there in, in the early 70s. As I was, as I well, was. Yeah. You know, Vandergraaff, Generator, Genesis, King Crimson. It was uh, absolutely brilliant. And so on the strength of that half an hour conversation, Chris took me on <laughs> as a field archaeologist. No experience. Wow. Um, uh, and it was just it was just a bit of luck that he came along uh, at that time. So off I went for the next few years, being a field archaeologist and being trained up by Chris. We went, you know, so many so many sites. And I learned so much about field archaeology with Chris during that time. Um, but there came a time when 
he said, you, you've got to go to university. You've got to get the theory and, and, and uh, in the background. You can't just not go to university and get anywhere in, in archaeology. So I um, eventually um, uh, got into the University of Southampton on a history and archaeology degree. Um, I carried on working for Chris. So I was very lucky, you know, I had, had all of this experience. So you can imagine when I started the degree, the 18 and 19 year olds mm. who, were, who were starting the degree with no experience whatsoever. I'd been a field archeologist for two years. I was just way ahead. I had a big advantage over them. And I was like, you know, I didn't have to work in a bar or in a garden center. I, I could carry on doing the archeology span to fund the degree. So, um, uh, uh, so that's from 95 to 99, I, I carried on and got an MA. And then I was fortunate enough to get a place at Trinity College, Cambridge, to do a PhD. Wow. And the PhD, and it's nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about today, but the, the PhD was very, very materialistic, kind of data driven PhD. It was looking at uh, English medieval monastic precincts. Mm -hmm. and most especially poor relief and how they organize the poor relief within those, you know, the almonry complexes in those outer precincts. So uh, so for, for those three years that I did the PhD at Cambridge, I, was, I spent much of my time in the archives of Westminster Abbey and Norwich Cathedral Priory, mm -hmm. which was quite, quite a privilege. So I have mm -hmm. very fond memories of going from Cambridge to London, spending the day in the uh, very archaic archive of Westminster Abbey um, and then uh, uh, and then walking out through the cloisters nobody else around uh, at five o'clock in the winter on a winter's night to go. very very fond memories but they, but this this was all very um, like I say it was data driven I was looking at statistics I was looking at archaeological records from previous digs to work out what was going on in, in these precincts and all the while I was doing that I was my real interests were going elsewhere which was slightly problematic for the PhD because if you do a PhD you've got to be zoned in and um, especially if you're going to try and do it in three years um, but my interests were already veering off into more esoteric territory and especially uh, folklore mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so as soon as I finished the PhD, although I carried on as an archaeologist working with Chris, I was spending more and more time traveling around the country, looking most especially at prehistoric sites, Neolithic. Um, what stimulated that then? Well, I've got a pile of books here, Anthony, and I'm going to pull each one up as I'm sort of just... <laughs> So there's a 1976 book by the archaeologist called Leslie Grinsell called Folklore of Prehistoric Sites in Britain. And I read that when I was at Cambridge and that sparked that. It suddenly made me realize that all of the mostly Neolithic sites and Bronze Age, I guess, have a, um, have a welter of uh, folklore attached to them. And most especially folklore included involving the fairies and so once i left cambridge i spent a, a, a lot of time traveling around the country going to these sites and by that time i was already into meditation so i'd been practicing meditation since about 98 99 and i was thinking well you know is there, is there is there anything to it is there a resonance at these sites which has attracted did all of this folklore to these very in, in, important monuments um and so, so shall i tell you about my first experience mm, please um, please yeah so here's, here's another book and this is slightly um uh, less academic but massive influence on me Oh, I had that. Yes, beautiful book. So yeah. it's Fairies by Brian Frood and Alan Lee. Alan Lee went on to do the design for the Lord of the Rings films. Um, right. And you can see that in some mm. of his images. 
but it's the Brian Froude images which really resonated with me. And um, yeah, there's something in them. And there's the way that Brian Froude writes about fairy encounters and his knowledge of the folklore and how he is completely open to the fairies actually being a real uh, type of entity that attracted me. And so before I tell you about the experience, I, I do have to tell you that I had to kind of hide this side of me from um, uh, my fellow archaeologists and especially Chris, because um, there, there is a, there is a, there's a core of rationalism, which is heavy in archaeology. I'm not saying all archaeologists uh, are like that, but you're not supposed to go off the garden path. Mm. It seems, doesn't it, that subjects such as psychology, archaeology, what you call the soft sciences, are so preoccupied with their credibility. Um, yes. They really, you know, it's the, the the old thing of functionalism and Talcott Parsons in sociology, and it, it 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 means that they're so desperate to be scientific, they completely throw the baby out with the dishwater, don't they? Um, that, that is absolutely correct, and and I soon found, you know, I tried I tried having a discussion about Leslie Grinsell's book and what's the importance of the folklore with these uh, Neolithic sites with a couple of archaeologists one night and it was basically you know just this is just this is just woo woo this is rubbish you, you need to stop looking at it because it's just new age wishful thinking um i even had a, a discussion I, I knew that you will know the late mick aston from time team hmm. Hmm. Uh, yes. who who i was friends with for the last couple of years of his life before he died in 2013 and I even breached the subject with him once, and he he, he was an, he's a super rationalist, great guy, absolutely fantastic guy, and I can't do his black country accent, but basically basically he said, Neil, don't go there, it's not worth it. You will lose all your credibility uh, if you start to talk about these things. Fair enough, but 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 long before then, once I once I started touring. These, these sites and for, for, for people who aren't aware the Neolithic period in, in Britain has left us probably the biggest amount of the, the, the earliest amount of monumental structures there, there's nothing really before the Neolithic there's little bit, bits and pieces but this is when they started to the humans start to implant themselves on the landscape and you're talking about how many years BC when we talk about the Neolithic period well Neolithic is usually seen as about three and a half thousand BC okay. to um, uh, about 2000 BC, was, you know, okay. give, give, give and take. But, it, but, but so you're getting monuments such as stone circles being the most obvious um, one. You'll get causeways enclosures, but you'll also get long barrows. So long barrows are the best, uh, they seem to have been used for many purposes, burial. Uh, and ritualistic purposes. They're probably multi-purpose monuments. Um, and there's quite a few of them still here in, 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 the, in the country. And there's one, it's, you, you, you may be aware of this one, uh, it's near Avebury, and it's called West Kennet. Oh, I love it. West Kennet, fascinating, yes. It's, it's, West Kennet Long Barrow, yeah, it's, unbelievable. Yeah. It, is, it is amazing. If, uh, if, if, if these lockdowns ever end, this, that will be one of the first places I'll be heading back to. Uh, you know, there the is age. an atmosphere there, isn't it, that you can't describe, you know, that whole area. Well, I'll try yeah. to describe it, Anthony, if I, if, uh, if, mm. if I can tell you about the experience Please. in 1995, which, 95, was it 95, 96, thereabouts, um, when a friend and I went to West Kennet Long Barrow. And this is the this is the, the first time I'd ever thought, well, I can meditate at one of these structures to see if anything happens. Just just as just as an experiment, rather than just wandering around um, the, the, the the structure. So up we went at dusk, uh, you know, a liminal time when these things are more likely to happen. And we, it was a beautiful, beautiful evening. It was in the summer. And we just basically set up in, within the, the burial chamber at the back of the, the long barrow, um, almost dark and went to meditation. 
Now, I've never been able to work out when uh, what happened next. Was I in a meditative state or had I fallen asleep and was I in a hypnagogic state? Um, I'm not sure I can, it, and this is a long time ago now, and I've never been able to quite work, work, work this out. But all I know is that it was a turning point in my life because it was the first time that I experienced something, what you might generally term as supernatural. And so, so there we were, and whichever state I, I was in, whether it was meditative or, or, or hyp hypnagogic, one of Brian Froude's fairies turned up. Um, uh, well, you know, a typical folkloric fairy with his little hat on and his coloured clothes, a humanoid face, but not quite human, very small, marching up the passageway towards me. Mm -hmm. No words spoken, um, just the visual. And... That will that would have lasted a few seconds. Did he acknowledge you? Did he could you could you sense? He, he, he seemed to be looking at me, and wow. that. But again, you think about a hypnagogic episode mm. where you may think exactly the same thing. But this seemed to last a little bit longer, which is why I've always actually thought, well, this was I was in a meditative altered state of consciousness, and for whatever reason, and we'll come come to this maybe later. Um, uh, this entity turned up and now one thing I realized quite quickly is that I was perhaps predisposed to see that type of entity rather than another because of being aware of mm. fruit drawings in, in uh, illustrations in the book so so if I'd have perhaps really gotten into, I don't know, ghosts or aliens uh, in those previous years, would I have seen a ghost? Would I have seen an alien? Is this an entity which has no form, which has turned up within my consciousness in that space and has taken that form because of my predisposition to think of, oh, fairies, long barrows, connection? Never worked that one out, um, but it was the first time. And as, as we'll talk about later, there's been many incidents uh, uh, ever since. And so, and so th that was whenever I'd come up against a, a kind of reductionist argument from anyone against any of this stuff, I always had that direct Gnostic knowledge of the incident which I think is so important. You, once, you, once you know it, you can't allow anyone else to rationalise it out of you. I was listening to Sarah, it was a couple of weeks, two, two or three weeks ago, on, 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 on this stream, talking about exactly that, where um, once it happens to you, it won't go away. And she was talking especially about, uh, I think it was, you know, OBEs mm. and and lucid dreaming. And if you haven't experienced it and you've got a reductionist materialist mindset, you will just think it's crazy. It's just, it just cannot exist. That, that cannot happen. But once you have experienced it, um, well, nothing can shake you. Well, I, I guess it could, but it shouldn't because you've experienced it directly i think that's that that kind of gnosticism is is incredibly important to all of the things that um i came to understand after that event but that was the first event hmm. um so you know uh, as i say, I'm, I'm trying not to bore you with my entire life story this but, is uh, not neil this is not boring <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating please continue well well it's um i, I just want to sort of finish off going from my life as an archaeologist albeit kind of wayward archaeologist who was more into the folklore and more into the esoteric stuff by certainly the 2000s and uh, eventually i joined an organization called the church's conservation trust and i was more of a conservation manager um, than an archaeologist there although we did 
quite a lot of archaeology. And I stayed there until 2015 when my eyesight became a problem. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm. But um, once that happened, I was given free reign to drop the archaeology. I'm still interested in archaeology. I still sort of love aspects of it. But I converted myself into a folklorist. And not a folklorist who goes around, collect. I've never collected a story from anyone in my life, but uh, I know how to do research. I know how to look at historical documents. And I thought, well, let's just let's just try this. And so since, well, 2016, really, I've been uh, running my blog site, writing for magazines and websites um, and, and you know, book chapters, this, the, you know, the usual sort of thing, um, exploring folklore not really as a traditional folklorist but trying to put a new slant on it and there's lots of other people not i'm not saying it's just me doing this but there in fact there are a lot of people who are starting to look at folklore and compare it to well modern folklore mm. um, uh, entity contact non-human intelligent entities what are they what's their relations to things like the fairies and I've certainly found that much more enjoyable than my certainly in my later years as an archaeologist, which I started to get a bit bored with, to be honest. So that, that's my slightly unusual journey. Uh, obviously, we will talk more extensively about the eyesight and what, 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 what what's mm -hmm. happened with that. But that's 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 the timeline, and that's why I'm here talking to you now. Yeah, and it was of course um, when you contacted me over one or two of your own experiences, which I featured in my book, The Hidden Universe. Um, and your encounters with entities were extremely fascinating. And again, if she's watching, Susan Demeter, who was a previous guest here, also has had similar experiences to yourself. So the question here really is, you know, these entities themselves, you know, what are they? Are they part of us? And, you know, I have the concept of the egregorial in a world that you've used as well. And it's quite interesting. One of the, uh, now Parkinson made, made a reference to um, being aware of the work of Patrick Harper and Patrick Harper's work on demonic reality is also very intriguing. And it's somebody, again, I'd like, I've been in contact with Patrick over in the past and it would be fascinating to probably get him on the show in the future. But focusing in then, so your how did your, your experiences then continue from there? So you'd had this extraordinary consciousness-changing experience, that suddenly there was something where you had experienced the liminal, you'd experienced the, the overlapping reality that seems to sit between this reality and whatever is beyond, what I would call the canoma and the pleroma. Yeah. How did that then continue? So you had the initial experience at West Kennet, you were then attuned to it. Mm. So well, how did they then develop from there? Um, that's, that's a good way of putting it, that, that you suddenly become attuned to the fact that there is something else. Is it another reality? Is it another aspect of your own consciousness? That's what I wanted to investigate. That's what I found so interesting. Um, so the meditation continued. Um, I would say it was several years after that the problem with an incident like that uh, an experience such as that is you think oh this is going to start happening all the time this is great this is really interesting and of course it didn't i, I camped out at many neolithic uh, monuments over the over the years in the early 2000s mostly with a, a good friend of mine um uh trying the meditation uh no nothing lovely experiences lovely places but there is nothing but that proves doesn't it that it's it's something that is is more independent of us the fact you can't make it just happen because you want it to happen is such Absol a, something very absolutely however um uh, well we need to come on to the subject of psychedelics mm. because that uh, certain psychedelics can make things happen now of course the the reductionist materialist argument will always be you've just altered your brain chemicals and it's an hallucination that's all there is to it explains I, I find the people who, who, who say that are people who have never taken a psychedelic 
um, because you've got to understand what it does to you, especially at high doses and especially with uh, a substance like DMT, uh, dimethyltryptamine. So uh, in probably the late 2000s, I decided to take some psychedelics for various spiritual reasons. You know, I wasn't going out and having a great big party. I wasn't going to a rave on psychedelics. I was just doing it for my own progress, spiritual progression. So I would always do it alone. And the first time I did it alone was at my home. I lived in London at the time. And uh, this, this was LSD, quite a high dose. And sure enough, the fruit characters turned up again, this time in a more lengthy, lengthy, it was a couple of minutes worth of it. There were other things that happened during that experience, such as, such as you know, something, the deep um, emotional, spiritual things that can happen when, when you take a, a trip on a large dose of psychedelics. But these chaps turned up near near the beginning. And again, I think I'd primed myself for this because I was I was read I was looking at this, knowing I was going to take that trip, thinking, you know, can I invoke you from this? Am I going to just tap into something that has been expressed by Brian Froude and Alan Lee? You know, they knew what they were doing. They've got a they've got a handle on what these entities might be. And so did I prime myself for it? Did I just invoke them? I, 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 I don't know. I, I th the, the feeling on that, on, on that occasion was there was something there, some entity, some non-human intelligent entity that was with me in the room. And it just so happened that I interpreted those entities as fairies, mm -hmm. as folkloric fairies, because by that time I'd done much more extensive research into the folklore of fairies. Yeah, it was as if they clad themselves on your expectations in order yeah. for for, the, you to, for them to be acceptable to you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, and uh, so, and th this continued. Um, I, uh, I I do hope no members of the Merseyside Constabulary are watching at the moment. <laughs> and if they are, this was all a long time ago and I don't do it anymore. I just There probably will be, but I know who he's likely to be and he's on side <laughs> with us, believe me. Good. Aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> he's actually an undercover policeman. He's just trying to get confessions up. <laughs> oh, don't. Um, uh, uh, so, 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 yeah, sorry. So, so, so this continued... Yeah, through, through the 2000s, every every maybe six months. And did the entities continue to manifest then every time you... Yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah you can never control that kind of trip. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was just... Deep was it emotion. the same entities or was it different ones? Yeah, no, the, that, that's the only time that they turned up as the fairies. Most, mm -hmm. of the, most of the other entities, and this wouldn't always happen, I'd say 50%, less than 50% of times that I would take LSD you would add, actually have what you think of as an entity. Um, it was usually much more of a very deep emotional experience with no other beings. It's all internal. Um, that was the only time that happened. The only other entities were kind of, well, even these could be described as a kind of nature spirit fairy, where like sylph-like flying in the air. But that was very tenuous. I wouldn't like to say, well, they, they are definitely humanoid flying creatures um so that that was that was all a little bit tenuous and then in 20 when you get when you get to this age you forget the years don't you <laughs> there's too many of them you, you look back was that 2010 or 200 20 you know 2001 2010 this was about it was about 2010 um when i first took dimethyltryptamine and well, that is something completely different. And I think this is a very important point. Previous to doing that, what I've been, the experiences I've been talking to you about, I was 
definitely in this world. And they were coming here. Whatever they were, however they were doing it, wherever they lived the rest of the time, they were coming into my world, my consciousness. The first time I took dimethyltryptamine, and most people who take take it will tell you the same, you go into another world. The world you're in is left behind and you're in their world. Um, both times, I've take, taken it twice, and both times, well, you blast through. You'll, you'll be well aware of all of the um, uh, cases from Rick Straussman's um, study of DMT in the 1990s. And I am, but if you want to explain a little bit about it for the, the, the watchers or the listeners or the egregorial watchers out there who may or may not... <laughs> We have touched upon these subjects many, very often in these shows, but nevertheless, it, you know, reiterating is always important. Sure, sure. So Rick Strassman, Dr. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico in, uh, in the early 1990s, first half of the 1990s, was the first person to get a license to allow clinical studies on to test people with levels of injected DMT, because until then it had been... Um, uh what's the word not certified um, um well Ill illegal yes. <laughs> yeah you, you, even for even for clinical studies you couldn't use dmt because it was a schedule one drug scheduled that's the word mm. um uh and he there were about 50 participants and this went on over several years and each of them was injected with varying amounts of dimethyltryptamine and then their experiences recorded afterwards. Interestingly, he got the license by suggesting this could be therapeutic. That was, you know, we're going to try this as a, as a therapy for, for people with various mental health issues. Um, but what he got was something completely different. The, almost without exception, certainly above a certain dose of DMT, the people came back, and it's a bit, always a very short trip, it's 30 minutes maximum. They would come back and describe having blasted through to a completely new reality. And they were so absolutely certain that that reality is as real or, or more real than this one, that nothing could dissuade them um, otherwise. And he published the findings from that in a book called The Spirit Molecule in 2001. And uh, anyone who wants to find out about DMT and what it might do, all anecdotal accounts, subjective accounts, of course, but there's a similarity amongst them. Uh, one of the major similarities is that once you blast through to this new world, there are entities there and they will interact with you in a variety of ways, sometimes friendly, sometimes hostile, sometimes indifferent, but they're there and they're as real as another human being standing in the room with you when you come back from that trip. And it's a fascinating study, it's absolutely fascinating. And it's backed up by um, many other studies. I don't think there's been another clinical study of that sort there um, is there is something taking place that um, a future some, guest of this show and a friend of Sir is called Carl Smith is involved in and David correct. Luke, um, who um, is going to be a future guest on our show as well. Well, David Luke is brilliant on this, as, as mm. is Carl. Mm. But that but those studies haven't been done and completed yet, have they? No, it's they have not. As far no as I know, Sir, I don't know if you know whether they they are completed yet. I'm rather at... okay. Okay, uh, pray, pray continue. Uh, so. so uh, so, uh, allowing for the ones that are happening at the moment, and a great thing that is, the only other thing we have are surveys. Um, uh, the first one is, I'm sorry, let me check my notes for, for the chap's name, Peter Mayer. Peter Mayer, um, um, well, well, from a variety of sources, he got 360 descriptions of DMT trips, and that can be added to from the the website called Erowid. Erowid, yeah, that's just what I was going to suggest. Yeah, 
which has trip reports for all kinds of... Um, Can you just explain and, and spell it out for people? Because I'm sure people will be thinking, this is a website I need to check out. Can it's, you just... definitely, it's, it's probably the premier website for all sorts of advice on all sorts of drugs and contains experience reports, thousands, tens of thousands of experience reports from all types of drug. And so it's e r o w i d dot org, okay. and you go there and you will, well, you can take a look at these tens of thousands of trip reports. Now, of course, these are all anecdotal. Uh, the the person leaving the trip report may be lying, they might be uh, deluded, um, maybe doing it for all sorts of purposes. But once you look at a few, you do start to realise that. These are just people giving an honest opinion of something that happened. And of course, the DMT reports, it would say almost exclusively, almost without exception, involve meeting entities in an other world. And that, uh, that I would say, we can, if we have time, we can perhaps bring that and link that into the folklore and how that that that, mm. that links in with certain folklore motifs but i think this is a very important distinction um uh well can you call lsd a lighter psychedelic uh, 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 lighter psychedelics or meditation or even 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 trauma uh, all sorts of things such as that may allow an entity whatever they are wherever they're coming from into your reality uh, as far as i know actually this might not be uh, we can talk about temporal lobe epilepsy where which is also uh, a way of getting out of this reality into another reality but as far as i know the only surefire way to do it is to inject or smoke dmt at a certain level and without fail you will turn up into another reality now, once that had happened to me, especially the second time, which was a bigger dose, it was a way too big dose. It was a bit foolish. But on, I was a bit. I was getting a bit, uh, a bit carried away on the, on the second time. But the second that that second time convinced me beyond any reason that there is another world existing just a hairbreadth away from us and it's just finding out a means of getting there can you tell us you... more about the trip that you had then the big one the well the powerful one oh well it's can i can i get before i do just mm. to sort of prime people who aren't still that familiar with um mm. uh, uh, uh the, the dmt world i want to just read out to you we could we could actually spend the rest of the time just sort of exchanging quotes by Terence McKenna. Oh, the great yeah. Terence McKenna and the Machine Elves. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Terence McKenna wrote a lot about DMT. I'm sure most viewers will know Terence McKenna as he died in 2000, I think. Um, and he, he let, let's say he was an enthusiastic user of DMT, <laughs> and and he wrote brilliantly about it, describing what are, is often very difficult things to describe you know um uh, very difficult to bring back the description and try and explain it to someone but it's just this beautiful little quote from terence which i can read if i could read out mm -hmm. dmt is a reliable method for crossing into a dimension that human beings have debated the existence of for fifty thousand years is there an invisible nearby world inhabited by active intelligences with which human beings can communicate you bet and if you don't think so then tell me you don't think so after smoking 75 milligrams of dmt otherwise we just don't have anything to talk about <laughs> typical sort of uh terence language but very you know he's right mm. you can't he, and coming back to, to to this point of that gnostic direct experience um uh that's the important thing once i came back from that trip and you know i hate to say it but they weren't fairies they were machine-like they were machine-like and this is often a 
this is often an attribute of of DMT, where things are a bit mechanical, things are a bit sci-fi. Now, again, have we been predisposed to to that? Because um, uh, DMT in the taken traditionally in ayahuasca, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. That is how I pronounce it. So ayahuasca. who knows? Who knows? Um, so Amazonian tribal communities have been taking that, where DMT is the prime component, active component, for hun- probably hundreds of years. And they're not experiencing mechanical mm. um, uh, me- mechanical entities or machines in the same way that most Western people mm. who take DMT experience it there 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 is um there there is some exceptions i I think more recently some some indigenous amazonian tribal people are experiencing it there's a a wonderful series of illustrations graham hancock talks about these illustrations by i'm going to forget his surname it's pablo 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 Mm -hmm. moringo thank you brilliant we're good in this show you know we're good yeah, it's, look at it, lightning. That was absolutely. Was Thank you, Sarah. Um, Pablo Amaringo. Great. Sorry? I love Pablo Amaringo. Well, his illustrations. Anyone, you know, you can get it easy. Just you know, search for it. Images online. Pablo Amaringo, and you will get his colourful visions of his DMT trips, Ayahuasca trips, and some of them and of course he, he he only died recently so we're talking about you know he, he's, he's been doing this since the 1960s and some of them include uh, what would usually be described as a UFO, a ufo and so there are elements but maybe that's only creeping in to the indigenous people's ex- experiences because of the western influence on them previous to to, to say the 1960s when Westerners became aware of what was going on in the Amazon you don't tend to get any of that description it's, it's all about reptiles and animals uh, so so that I find that interesting and it comes back to that experience your pr- predisposition to what you're going to get and even if it's a totally mind-blowing DMT experience where you have no control over where you're going even then the entities or the environments that you turn up with will meet certain expectations i think we were talking about that i can't remember what session it was on but the kind of cultural specificity of dreaming for example Mm. and if you do start talking about um going into other realms that those realms do meet cultural certain cultural expectations like like you say amazonian tribes people don't generally dream of croydon high street and uh people in croydon high street don't generally dream of being in the amazon rainforest so it is like you're you're creating those realms in your mind to some extent and maybe fitting your preconceived ideas onto the nature spirits i like the idea of that that makes Mm. that makes a lot of sense to me I find it really fascinating what you're saying, actually, because I feel very similarly about my fascination with ancient history and archaeology comes from this idea of trying to get into the mindset and the philosophy of ancient people. And I don't really understand um, archaeologists being so uh, short sighted often with that, because surely the most fascinating thing is the lived experience of those people that they're researching and yeah. wanting to imagine what their life was really like on the deepest possible level. Yeah. I, I'd say I'd say a good example of exactly what you're talking about there is Graham Hancock. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, I'm a great fan of Graham Hancock. I think he's done some fantastic work and most most recently on you know his big theory about there having been a comet hit on the earth about 12,000 years ago and he's been saying this for decades and then sure enough two years ago some scientists find the remains of a comet hit in Greenland about 12,000 years ago <laughs> whereas Graham Hancock was taking so much flack for some of these theories which you know they're tenuous theories they're hypotheses but he's not 
plucking it out of thin air. Mm, exactly. Uh, the guy's a good researcher and he's taken so much flack and I'm so glad that he's getting some uh, credence now and some archaeologists are just having to shut their mouth. Um, they don't like it, but uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, he was right. And what he was also, so, sorry, coming back to what we're talking about, what, he, what he's writing about in a book, here we go, all the books lined up. So his book, wonderful book yeah supernatural a that's a 2005 book so the the whole title supernatural meetings with the ancient teachers of mankind um and in that book that was very influential on me when, when i read it i didn't read it in 2005 it was later than that but it's very influential because what he managed to do was link up ancient cave paintings with folkloric fairies and then uh, alien UFOs, mostly in terms of the abduction scenarios. And it, uh, he, he was using, um, uh, I'm going to forget the name, uh, the archaeologist who first proposed that these cave paintings were the result of people who had taken psychedelics, obviously natural psychedelics. Um, it wasn't Lewis. Paul. Lewis. Hmm. Lewis was a double barrel name. It'll, it'll come to me. South hmm. African guy. And he was, this was in the 90s, in the 90s, he first came up with this theory because there are so many what are called entoptic images in these cave paintings, like swirling patterns, and they match exactly the same patterns that you see when you're coming up from LSD or, or psychedelic. And it's consistent in all of these cave paintings. Um, and then these cave paintings uh, in, include humanoids uh, of various types, what what Hancock calls uh, therianthropes, so sort of part human, part animal. And some of them uh, look very much like the fairies that were described from the Middle Ages onwards, um, in terms of what they were, what what they what they looked like. So Hancock skillfully takes that. Takes take take takes the cave paintings, puts it into the folklore, and then goes out even further and says, "Well, actually, what the alien abductors are doing in from the twentieth century onwards, there are lots of similarities. You know, this folklore story is almost exactly the same as this abduction case. And okay, the aliens have changed a little bit more, and they're coming down in spaceships, but there are so many similarities. Are these not all the same thing? And I guess." Could that be an example of a cultural kind of egregore evolving with uh, humankind and our material culture? Because as we invent things like the Egyptian hieroglyphs, for example, as they invented more material culture, they expanded their, their lexicon of, of symbols because they had more stuff to yeah. include in their language. And I think something similar happens culturally a lot um something you were saying reminded me of um the the kind of popularity and the endurance of elves in icelandic folklore actually and the fact that a lot of icelandic people still believe in elves and regularly say that they see elves and it also reminded me of uh, you know mark plotkin's book tales of a shaman's apprentice he was an ethnobotanist who was uh trained in i think maybe the botanical gardens in New York or somewhere like that and went over to spend a year in the Amazon living with tribes and he ended up devoting his entire life to protecting tribes in the Amazon rainforest because he had a fantastic experience with them and he was a very um, reductionist kind of scientifically minded person but he worked with all these different tribes and I know he encountered one tribe where they all consistently saw little people that were kind of like shadow like small figures in the forest and uh his ex his book is fantastic and he does kind of talk from coming from this perspective of of really not believing in the spiritual dimension to recognizing that these people actually inhabit a completely different reality because of their experience of the world and the connection that they have with nature and i think that that's the the underlying value of this stuff for me is it all comes down to nature worship and recognizing that there are these energies and these um forces in nature that perhaps we've become blind to 
as a as a culture and we need something to worship and um you know like you say there are those energies that are present and um depending on what you're kind of inputting into your mind um they'll manifest in that way that you recognize like you said about the elves in the brian Freud book yeah it's an excellent point isn't it and one of the things that with Graham Hancock, I did an event with Graham Hancock um, around about 10 years ago, and we had a long chat about areas of overlap in our own particular areas of interest. And Hancock's work, as you know, in my book, The, uh, the Hidden Universe, I'm really intrigued by Hancock's writings of his experiences in the Drakensberg Mountains, in the Junction Shelter, and the way in which the, the entities or the paintings in the Junction Shelter seem to reflect paintings across the world so it seems again that there's a consistency here um, but one of the areas that really intrigues me and it's one of the themes that's coming up on regularly now in terms of these shows and we're really building up some really interesting ideas here and the idea of of the egregore the idea that the egregores seem to work with our own worldview and of course if we go into quantum physics and the idea that the act of observation and consciousness collapses a potentiality waveform into a reality which we then subsequently experience. Could there be linkages here within neurology uh, together with uh, linkages in terms of neurochemistry? And of course, when you bring together neurology and neurochemistry, and when you're using substances like dimethyltryptamine, what we collectively call entheogens, is this where the doors of perception are being opened and where these entities can come through? And of course, if you look back over the years, you know, you have the writings of people like Jacques Vallée and John Keel and various other writers in the UFO field who have been writing about this for many years, the parallels between entity encounters. And of course, a previous guest on this show, and I really, really suggest that people with what Neil is saying look into this together with what individuals like Myron Dial are saying. And of course, Neil, you touched upon TLE or temporal lobe epilepsy being a gateway to alternate realities that, 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 that happen with people without the need for DMT. And of course, this is what happens with um, Myron on regular bases. So we're building a very good picture here in terms of this. So, Neil, can you carry us forward now? I mean, it's astonishing. We've, we've already had an hour and it seems like five minutes. You know, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. Can we then move on now to, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to move on to the, the, the whole uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome overlap or whether you want to continue with the DMT, it's up to you because I'm just fascinated and I'll just sit and listen. So where well, do you want to take it from here? Well, uh, I mean, we, we you know we have another hour, don't we? So, we do. Oh, yeah, and um, another so half an hour on top of that, if you want. There's, there's, as we as we have plenty of time, and as we're kind of maybe just flesh out a little mm, bit. Mm, yeah, great. Um, what what you and Sarah and I have been talking about in terms of okay, we've, we've there are entities. Are they coming into this world? Can we go into their world? Where does our world exist? Where's the overlap? And coming back to someone we've just mentioned is David Luke, um, who is just one of the preeminent people studying DMT uh, in the, in recent years for sure. And you know, jolly good chap and very good, very, very good range of publications. Just check David Luke's publications out, and you will get all the detail you need for trying to understand that. And I always come back to his where, where he, he's talking specifically about the dmt experience but this could be applied to any, any entity experience brought about by any means and he bases this three-part interpretation he actually bases it on peter mayer's 10-part interpretation but i think david luke's is much more concise and yeah there are th you've got three choices about what is going on and frame i'm gonna to have to read 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 it out so I don't garble the, Please do. his, his points. So, uh, so remember David Luke is, 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 is talking about DMT, but it can be applied otherwise. And, and he's asking, well, okay, there are entities. What are they? One, 
they are hallucinations. The entities are subjective hallucinations. Such a position is favoured by those taking a purely materialistic, reductionist, neuropsychological approach to the phenomena. Two, they are psychological, transpersonal manifestations. The communicating entities appear alien, but are actually unfamiliar aspects of ourselves. Be they our reptilian brain or our cells, molecules, or even subatomic particles. And number three, the entities exist in other worlds and can interact with our physical reality. A numinous experience provides access to a true alternate dimension inhabited by independently existing intelligent entities in a standalone reality, which exists collaterally with ours and may interact with our world when certain conditions are met. The identity of the entities remains speculative. And I think that's that's it, isn't it? There are, uh, those are your choices. And you could argue that the second two have an overlap. Um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe they do have an independent existence, but that independent existence is dependent on human consciousness. Without human consciousness or an intelligent consciousness, do they exist? Coming back to you know the the the, the, the quantum physics double split, uh, double slit, does it exist? without someone there to, to, to see it, to observe it, is, is the observer absolutely essential? That, so, you know, I, I, I would certainly dispense with the first one, because although people have hallucinations, hallucinations can, 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 can happen, what we're talking about here um, has a tangible reality whether that reality is within your consciousness, after all, what else do you have but your consciousness, or whether it is some separate entity, um, uh, intelligent entity in their own world, which however you cross over it into it or however they cross into our world, it exists and it exists all the time. You know, one thing I find really fascinating about the DMT experience, because a lot of um, what you're talking about, I always look at it through the lens of dreaming and the ability of dreaming to create these incredible, fantastic environments. And especially if you're lucid, you have that experience of this is more real than real. Um, and one of the things that I think is uh, key to understanding ancient cultures and ancient spirituality is this ability of dreams to put you into contact with the ancestors so that you can dream of dead people and communicate with them and make peace with them and receive wisdom from them yes um and one thing i wonder about dmt is it's interesting that you don't see anyone that you know or i've never really heard anyone talk about a dmt experience in where they're talking with people that they're familiar with like you would in a in a dream there 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 is there is one example i can think of from peter mayer's Report where someone's talking about meeting their dead father, mm. but I can't think of it yet. Yeah, that is extremely unusual. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation, isn't it? You know, yeah. it does mean qualitative difference between dreaming and DMT experiences. There's that's definitely, uh, very I think there's definitely a qualitative difference, um, but also perhaps a similarity in terms of what we've just been talking about in how do you interpret these entities. Now, I've I've listened to, to you talking about dreams and I've, um, it's, uh, Sarah, I'm so, sorry, I've listened to Sarah talking about dreams and who was it, who was it, I, I, was it, were you talking about with Kaz the other week? Possibly, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but you were talking about, you know, do the people in the dreams, that yeah, you're dreaming, Kaz, yeah. do they exist? Um, uh, and again, I can't remember who said it. It was a very memorable um, image, though. You're in a dream, and in that dream, you want to say, right, all, all the people who don't don't really exist, who are part of me, can you all clear off? And uh, and the real ones, the real entities from somewhere else, stay in the room. All right, that's very interesting because I've always, until recently, I've always seen dreams as basically David Luke's number two. They are 
within your consciousness, you are simulating that reality totally by yourself. Everyone in that dream, every environment, every piece of action, you've made the lot up. Mm -hmm. And you will only, uh, when you transcend from that dream, you come back to this. And this is, uh, I know you're going to argue against that, Sarah, but. Uh, I, it, would, I would say that there are definitely, I think that's a lot of dreams. And then there are sometimes dreams where you feel like you've had contact with something that's beyond your sphere of influence. I, I guess if it's a lucid dream, that kind of blows my interpretation out of the water. I think, yeah, I see, uh, because I'm really familiar with my dream life, and I think sometimes I've, especially doing a lot of dream works, I mean, I meet a lot of people that have taken psychedelics and they haven't really ever got into their dreams. And so for them, a psychedelic is just like, this is something I've never experienced, even had a taste of an alternate reality before. Um, but I think, you know, like when we were talking to Rebecca Sharrock, for example, her highly superior autobiographical memory and the fact that she can remember every dream and she's lucid in every dream means that she kind of knows where every single thing in a dream comes from and she can make a kind of judgment about its origins and why it's there and she can reference it back to things from her memory. Um, and I found that fascinating because to a lesser degree, I feel also that a lot of the stuff that's in my dreams, I can be like, oh, I know where that came from. I know where that came from. And it can be things like words, like you're talking about looking at your fairy book and then thinking I'm going to see these entities. I, whenever I read novels before bed, there'll be something from that novel that's in the dream, whether it's manifesting a visualization of a word that I may not have taken account of in a way um, whereby I've thought about it too visually. But there's so much information that we is seeded into our mind that we manifest in dreaming. But yeah. yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think for the most part, dreams are all generated by uh, your subconscious and your mind and your human experience on Earth. Um, and they're kind of reorganized in different fantastic ways. But then I would definitely also say that there is occurrences where you you are able to contact something beyond your individual consciousness and i feel like i've had experiences whereby i've made contact with the collective unconscious if you mm. if you want to call it that yeah well obviously that's that's that that kind of jungian collective unconscious will most often appear in dreams mm. according you know according to, to Jungian psych psychologists. Can, can we just go right off piste at the moment? Absolutely. I know we're not talking about dreams, and um, we're not supposed to be talking about dreams, but uh, I think it's very We're talking about what you want to talk about, Neil. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the point of the programme. Uh, there we go. In my big book pile that I have prepared earlier, <laughs> I, you won't have seen this book, will you? No. So it's by a philosopher called J.J. Valberg, and it's called Dream, Death, and the Self. And he talks, as you can say, as you can see, very extensively. Um, he talks exactly what we've just been talking about. He's coming from a very traditional philosophical um, background and perspective, where he's suggesting that because we cannot, when we're in a dream, we cannot tell that it's everything's real in the dream everything is as real as it is in this life and therefore how do we know that this isn't a dream and how do we know that when this dream stops we will just transcend and we will remember this as we remember every night's dream obviously he, he does that um uh, uh, more extensively in 500 pages than i just summarized but <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an amazing book and sarah if you're into dreams it's, some of the language is very thick philosophical language yeah, he's, he's he's old school philosopher how long ago was the book written is it comparatively new yeah it's um 2000 i think mm. let me see Two, oh no 2007 Right. Okay. That's that's well worth sourcing a copy of that. I think that looks quite intriguing. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It, it, unfortunately, it's fifty quid to if you if you want it. Ouch. But, um, it's um, uh, uh, the Anthony Pick Book Club. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll put it there. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a difficult read, and it's it's what um, uh, this is where I'll end this because you know I know we're not. I know you say we can talk about anything, but this is sort of really going off piece. But he also has the best section I've ever read on the subject of solipsism. Mm -hmm. um, and solipsism is something that has always fascinated me. And I've, and you alone. I've never, I've never, <laughs> most people, well, well, you know, obviously you and Sarah don't actually exist. No, of course we don't. We're just um, figments of your imagination. You are. And how can I prove otherwise? You can't. That's so tell us more then. Where does he, where does he go on solipsism then? Well, it, it, most philosophers, it's become a bit of a taboo subject. It has, which is bizarre because really it's the only thing you actually do know, you know, but going back to Berkeley, you know, the, the, you know. Exactly. And that is exactly what um, Valberg says and he's very reluctant to do it he's very sk skillful he puts up every objection like a proper traditional philosophy mm. philosopher here's the objection can't possibly be true but actually it is true because you cannot get out of your consciousness he calls it the horizon the consciousness horizon this is it everything that happens in the world everything you've experienced it, it happens within your horizon you can't get out and no one can get in it's what charles stewart pierce called the phaneron it's the same kind of idea, isn't it? Right. You know, but yeah. if we are if we are all one singular consciousness experiencing ourselves subjectively, that gets over the problem of solipsism, because we're all experiencing the same thing, because we are all the same thing, and consciousness is singular, but yeah. it's pluralized within this particular part of the simulation, which is yeah. a very interesting idea. Yeah. 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 So. 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 But. But that. Uh, yeah. So the idea of of solipsism uh, is it still nags me. Mm. It's one of those things because you can't disprove it mm. from your own perspective. However, however you um, uh, uh, you, you attempt to interpret it, it's one of the critiques that people make of my cheating the ferryman hypothesis and say, you know, it's it's solipsism in the sense that you are experiencing your life again, or you're experiencing your life in some form of brain generated or something generated simulation of your life. But of course, the question then has to be other consciousnesses and what are they and if they are emanations of you or if more importantly um, and there was a book I contributed a chapter to a few years ago called pandeism and anthology yeah. the idea of pandeism the idea that you know everything consciousness is what we would term god for want of a better term and we are all emanations of that consciousness that have decided for whatever reason to come into this simulation suffering from amnesis that is forgetting that we are what we are and of course i can then reference directly you know to philip k dick and philip k dick's book the divine invasion where you have a young man called manny who is god but forgotten he's god but of course this is going back to gnosticism again it's it there's some fascinating ideas here and i'm glad you brought up solipsism because you know you get these kind of glib statements from philosophers you know that solipsism is utter nonsense but a point of fact is it is completely the opposite. You know, it is the only thing you can actually know, you know. That Valberg, again, you know, after, after he puts up a hypothesis against it, every time he comes back and says, it's the only thing you can actually know. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, he uses the dream an analogy. You know, you're in a dream. You think all those people who exist, you think they're all consciousnesses. Mm, yeah. you, think, you think you're interacting with another person. Well, no, you aren't. You just made it all up. So I know, because this is the argument when people... Sorry. That, sorry, Sarah, go on. I was just going to say that does that is dependent on your experience of dreaming, isn't it? As it is it dependent on your experience of everything. Someone who's religious and believes that they have an experience with God, like you were talking about Gnosticism, um, if someone experiences that, has that moment of gnosis... Um, really that's the kind of true value in being alive like i think we need we have to have these transcendental moments otherwise we're just um machine elves like mm. maybe the dmt's trying to show us <laughs> uh, yeah why not <clears throat> well that was a fascinating aside and i think a very important <laughs> one because you know it's one of the areas that i think ultimately you know we are born alone and we die alone and, you know, that that is a statement of fact, you know, and everything quantum physics is very much telling us that, you know, this relationship between the observer and the observed and the feedback mechanism between this, you know, that there's something you sometimes feel, don't you, that it's it's something 
you can just about understand just on the further reaches of your understanding and sometimes you can grasp it and sometimes you understand it you know it's the idea of the the idea of this kind of sudden feeling of inspiration sudden feeling of understanding but you lose it again and these tend to happen in dreams don't they you know you have a a dream sequence and suddenly just before you wake up you've got it all you understand it all and then you lose it all again and again this is the wonder of consciousness isn't it yeah and and a good reason to keep a dream journal no, very much so. It's um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, I have to say, it's, sorry, we're going off piece again here. It's all right. Where, do, where, where, where do you want to take us in terms of the piece now? <laughs> well, it's, it's just dreams during lockdown. I've seen so many mm. people, uh, you know, in my friends' net network, social network, talking about how crazy their dreams have been. Oh, I love that. I love that people are starting to take notice of their dreams. I've been phoned up by the BBC, like local radio stations all the time to talk to people. And it's really funny because their um, presenters will always be like, I'm having these really weird dreams. And, um, you know, it's about um, crawling with ants or uh, not being able to see my family and friends. What does it mean? <laughs> and, you know, I think if, like I was saying, if you're not familiar with your dreamscapes or the way your subconscious mind works, yeah, people are really bamboozled by it. But um, yeah, and 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 when it when it gets onto the mainstream like that, there's always that horrible tendency that they always carry through. There's an element of oh, well, it's a load of old nonsense. Really. Yes, it's very irritating. You get that. There's always the caveat. You know, yeah. that of course, this is all nonsense. And, and they have to make it kind of semi-silly. They'll either put silly music in the background or... And, you know, this is the most important thing. And this is why podcasts like this are so important. We're, we're taking it a totally different way. You know, we're saying this is intellectually stimulating. It's intellectually fascinating. And it's backed up by academic research. You know, let we don't need to go to the Sky Pilots for this. You know, we can back it up with known psychology, known research. As yeah. you said, the work of Rick Strassman and various other individuals. But this whole lockdown thing is very intriguing, isn't it? And that suddenly people are create that their own dreams are starting to, to, to emanate outwards almost. So you, you sent me an article that, that you'd come across, which I thought was very interesting. Do you want to touch upon that now? Because this is the perfect point to, to move back on piste, as it were, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and well, go downhill. Well, well, the, th the thing is, we haven't really talked about Charles Bonnet syndrome. We need to, but... which we need to. Should we go there now? Let's go there. Go there first. <laughs> yeah, please, please, because that's do what... Want to, do you want to talk about your mum, or do you want me to... Yeah, no, Alex... Well, I've explained it many times on this show, but effectively, like, very quickly, my mother um, died of Alzheimer's um, three years ago, but building up to her, her diagnosis with Alzheimer's, she had a series of events that were, were Charles Bonnet syndrome and in fact it intrigued me that when my mother was saying that she was seeing little little creatures in the house and everything else the way in which when I went to the doctors with her and explained to the doctor what I thought it was and I said I think she has Charles Bonnet syndrome the doctor was completely and blissfully unaware of the concept which astounded me because of course there's direct linkage between Charles Bonnet syndrome and and Alzheimer's but also I argue in my latest book that there's a direct linkage also to quasi-corporal companions that children have as well that these are all the same phenomenon and Charles Bonnet syndrome is is singularly one of the most intriguing elements of human experience um Siri Husfeld who is quite a famous American writer in her 30s and she describes which I describe in one of my books her experiences with with Charles Bonnet syndrome but you are an experiencer of Charles Bonnet syndrome as well so can you tell us a little bit about it from your point of view and your analysis of the subject because this is for you to talk not for me so tell us more okay well well people you should first know that Charles Bonnet was a uh, Swiss naturalist in the 1750s and his father suffered from glaucoma and he noticed that his father was seeing what he termed at the time hallucinations um, he was seeing animals children all sorts of shape shapes um, and, and geometric shapes so so he studied it further and then published I, I can't in the 1760s um he published uh, a couple of papers for the royal institute 
after he'd examined this phenomenon in in a couple of dozen people so that's where the name comes from that's why it's called charles bonnet not charles bonnet as i i'm ashamed to say i used i, I used to call it charles bonnet charles bonnet um so so that's where the name comes from and so it's been known since the mid 18th century that this is a syndrome um before before i talk about charles bonnet syndrome i, I need to just quickly say how what happened to my eyesight yeah no absolutely because it links basically because just to explain my mother lost one of her eyes with malignant melanoma and she had glaucoma in the other so she again when she started experiencing these things was partially sighted right um well I'll come to that that's an important point actually but um so uh my eyesight i have uh, in 2014 i had a central retinal occlusion in my left eye, which is basically like having a mini stroke in your eye. And so from from that date, my left eye was blind. There's light input, but it's it's basically blind and nothing you can do about it. Um, now, unfortunately, at the end of 2015, I managed to fall down the stairs in my then house and bash my head on the stone floor. And when I came round, um, the eyesight in my right eye was diminished. Oh, and after a couple of MRI scans over a year, it took a year for them to work out that there'd been an oxygen blockage in the neural cortex and that caused damage, which was causing this vision. Um, whenever, of course, a lot of people have difficulty with visual impairment in that people think you're blind or you're not blind. There's nothing in between. And uh, of course, that's not not true. So you, I, I'm fi always finding myself having to explain to people what my eyesight is like. And the nearest I can ever get to it is close your left eye and squint your right eye. That's that. It's not quite right, but that's as close as I can get to to explain it. So that's it. So it's, so it's a limited vision. I can't I can't drive a car. Um, I you know I can't do many things uh, i can read as long as the, the the text is of a certain size um uh so, so i'm okay i can get by but um that's that's the limit of m my eyesight um and after having five years to get i mean the first year i was always tripping over things and bumping into things as as my brain was adjusting to loss of peripheral vision and lot, well, lots of complete vision in the left left eye. So, it was, as you can imagine, it was very traumatic uh, for for that to happen. And with it, so we're, we're talking about the end of 2015, the start of 2016. I'm living alone um, in quite an isolated cottage in Somerset, which caused a lot of problems, as you can imagine, without being able to drive. Um, uh, I had to leave my then job um this is what we talked about earlier when i left the church's conservation trust and decided to become a folklorist well that took several months because when you lose that amount of eyesight the trauma that goes with it is quite extensive and i had a very very difficult time with my mental health mm. and just trying to come to terms with what what had happened um and it was at that point, May, it was in February, so this time in 2016, um, when I first experienced Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, remember, by this time, uh, I, I should have been used to entities coming into my reality through psychedelics, through the meditation, many years, and I'd come to accept that that was how things are. But of course, if you're meditating or if you're taking a psychedelic, you are purposely attempting to change your consciousness so something might happen. Uh, the first time Charles Bonnet syndrome happened to me, it was totally out of the blue. I'm just sitting on the sofa in, the, in a low light in the evening. And um, so... A, of course, this sound, after what we've been talking about, this shouldn't sound crazy. But every time I talk about it, I'm thinking people listening to me are just going to think I'm insane. 
and we'll come back to you know how important that is for for for, for people with this syndrome um so once again the brian frude furries turn up you know a troop of them three or four four of them walking along the armchair towards me um well what what do, what do you think i knew nothing about charles bonnet syndrome at this time by the way as I didn't know it existed um what do you think was i in a meditative state was i falling asleep you know she immediately started to rationalize what what's going on what what's how, what, what is causing this um but none of that was true i was wide awake and there they were and it lasted and it lasted a minute it lasted a long time they didn't do anything they didn't really interact with me but they were there they were on that armchair at the time i didn't reach out to see you know is there something there and i was also totally unafraid i mean if if <laughs> If a band of little blokes turn up into your remote cottage and get up onto your armchair, you might think, whoa, but I, it was it just, there was absolutely no fear. It was just, oh, this is interesting. How long is this going to go on for? Um, and then they, I can't remember how that first time finished. I can't remember what happened. Um, but then this became a regular occurrence. Um, and this is the case for most people with Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, it, it doesn't go away. Some people will get it once every six months. Some people have it every week. Uh, the experience I'm talking about. Um, and so the next time it happened, maybe a week later. And remember, I, I, I'm, obviously that experience is having me think throughout the week. I've lost quite a lot of eyesight. Am I going insane with the trauma that that's that's brought about? Um, that was a that was a worrying thing. I certainly didn't tell anyone uh, about it. And then the next time happened, it happened was what has usually subsequently happened with with, with the syndrome. There will be a. I always find this very difficult to um, attempt to explain what it's like. The nearest I can get to is think of a kaleidoscope what that looks like, take the colours out, just a grey kaleidoscope. It's as, all, as though it's there in in the air. It will move around for a little while and sometimes that will be it. That, that will go and that will be the, 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 the experience. Um, but m over 50% of the time, that grey kaleidoscope becomes an or one or more entities. And the entities are always, maybe a couple of exceptions, and there's one other thing that we can talk about afterwards. But uh, for most of the time, these entities are what I would, I would understand as folkloric fairies. And again, it comes back to the point that we've been over several times. Is that a predisposition? Is Charles Bonnet syndrome exactly the same as meditating or temporal lobe epilepsy or taking a psychedelic? It's just another way. Your brain is being tweaked. You know, Aldous Huxley's reducing valve is being tweaked and whatever is out there is coming in and you will interpret it in your own way and my own way because I'm, I'm so, so interested and studied for, and researched for such a long time folkloric fairies that's what they look like and the uh, so we're, we're talking four years now aren't we four years yeah over four years of this happening irregularly uh sometimes it'll happen once a week and then i'll maybe go a month and nothing happens and then there may be a few of the kaleidoscope geometric shapes and that's all but, you know, very quickly, just coming in on the geometric shapes, the thing that intrigues me here is the parallels you can draw with classic migraine. Mm. And, you know, I get classic migraine and I get that the geometric shapes and I get the breakdown and the scotoma in my visual field. It seems to be taking that one step further. You posted something like that on Facebook, something about that mm. on Facebook a few mm. weeks ago, didn't yeah, you? So and I, did. I saw that image. I think I commented on is that that's pretty similar to wow. the start of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's always the start. Wow. Sometimes it's the start and finish. It comes, that's it, gone, and that's wow. it. But at other at other times, and it's every single time, 
apart from that first apart from that first experience every single time since that happens before an entity um, what then happens so does the the entity does the entity come through the scotoma the breakdown in your visual field or what what's the what what then happens what the, the, the scotoma comes well whatever you want to call it the, mm. scotoma, the, 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 the kaleidoscope it will come it will disappear and in its place will be entities Wow. Um, and then the entities, you know, this, this this can last a few seconds. Sometimes it's just just will just last a few seconds, and other times it can last up to a minute. Mm. Um, and then the entities, I would perhaps need to explain first that there's a humorous element in them. Mm. There's some people might describe them as cartoon-like, but I think that misrepresents them a little bit. They're a little bit more than a cartoon. Um, and some there's a mischievous element in them which of course also goes back to fairy folklore a lot, a lot of the fairies were quite mischievous they were always up to nonsense and sometimes the the entities seem to if i'm sitting on the sofa they will jump over the arm and over out of sight and that will be it that will be the end of the <laughs> that will be the end of the experience other times there it's more like a fade out um it's it's more like I'm, I'm finding it more and more difficult to see them and then that's it it's just gone again a parallel here with with hypnagogic imagery we were talking about earlier mm. on you know and the idea that again there seems to be parallels here to classic migraine and hypnagogic imagery um, right and, um uh, uh shelley just commented uh, you do have kaleidoscopic vision in the eyes sometimes occurring as part of migraine and um other kind of issues as well um, and it is interesting to me, uh, really interesting to me because it reminds me of um, when I was a kid and I used to push the palms of my hands into mm. my eye sockets mm. and see uh, lots of different shapes. And that with wild, with the, with the wild technique of going into a lucid dream from being awake, you have the experience of seeing something like um, a pattern, like a, you were describing the kaleidoscopic pattern. And it's almost like an interference pattern that, mm solid form start to come out of and um it made it reminded me of that idea of the interference pattern or paradelia you know when you start to see faces and everything and mm. then those faces become more um more uh solid and start to take greater shape the more you kind of the more attention you give them yeah we've got we're on to something quite interesting here i think you know again you feel that we're touching on something that could be quite profound in terms of an, not necessarily an explanatory, but at least a structure to this. Because I've I've read about, for many years, Charles Bonnet syndrome, and I've written extensively about Charles Bonnet syndrome. But that's the first time I've heard a description of how the experience pans out, how it first manifests. Yeah. And that is... So the entities, do you feel that the entities are aware of you? Oh, definitely. Right. The, fir the that first time, that first time was a, a was an exception. Every other, every every subsequent experience has been much more standardised. In that, there's a definitely there's definitely eye contact. I should say there's nothing tactile about it. I've I don't think I've ever tried to touch them, um, and they've never tried to touch me. There's no tactility it's all visual and sometimes audio um and again apart apart from there there's an element of joking around it's almost so you know isn't this funny mm. interesting but, you said about that because i remember one of the things i took away from the the part about uh charles bonnet and the oliver sacks hallucination book was the fact that a, pe a lot of people in the old old people's homes that experience it enjoy it and they aren't scared of it and they recognize that it's like fun and creative and not dangerous well this was what my mother said you know when she said and it's interesting you say that it, you also hear them as well because my mother yeah. when my mother described it first time to me and she said the children and i've mentioned this many times so forgive me again but she turned around to me and she said the children have stopped singing to me mm. and she said but i don't really mean children the small people and they smile at me and they giggle and they laugh and they, they walk around with me. And they first started manifesting when she was shopping. And it was really strange because then she says, 
but the children are not as friendly as the old man in the kitchen. Mm. And then I said, which old man? And she said, oh, he's always very friendly. He smiles and he nods. Now, there could be a linkage made here again. And if you've not read this book, it's again a previous guest on this show, which we must get back again, Sarah, is a lady called Maggie Latorell. And Maggie Latorell wrote a book called The Gift of Alzheimer's. And what she did was she she wrote about her mother's deterioration into Alzheimer's over a period of months and she described in detail what her mother was reporting back so again we have this kind of breakdown of reality the doors of perception the as you said the Bergsonian uh, reducing valve is losing its it's losing its way and it's losing its ability to exclude the greater reality and the greater reality uses and it finds its way round the reducing engine to come through and to come through in that way is yeah. is fascinating. Can you tell us more about the entities then and, and, and what they do and what, well, and everything? Yeah. Well, of, of course, you know, we're, we're giving it a very positive slant mm. and, you know, after I've talked about the entities, I mean, there's a, a lot of people find this extremely difficult. I can imagine. Um, uh, imagine, someone who has who doesn't know any of the stuff that we, we're talking about and just lives a materialistic reductionist mm. um, existence they're going to think they're going insane but you could maybe come back to that okay it, 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 the so, so the audio is interesting and of, of course one of the main primary symptoms of schizophrenia is hearing voices so when i first started he hearing the voices always never voices alone or the voices would always be attached to these uh, visual entities and the first couple of times obviously your first thought is mm, this this could be you know how my schizophrenic and is the visual uh, the visual just another aspect of, of schizophrenia because they're starting to speak to me um <clears throat> the spoken word has never uh, the, Unfortunately, they're not telling me the meaning of life or any, um, uh, any <laughs> great wisdom that they might be able to impart on me. But what they do do is always tell me to be calm, drop the anxiety, don't worry. It's always something along th those lines. And once um, one of them did it in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, and it's maintena la calma which is Spanish for don't worry about it. And it took me ages after hearing that. It was very, expl very explicit in my mind. It took me ages to find out that it was Spanish and that's what it meant. And it was more or less what they were saying in English the rest of the time. I'm not sure what to make of that, but uh, but that's that's how it that's how it rolls out. And like I say, these 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 experiences will last sometimes just for a few seconds, especially if it's just the geometrics. Um, and the long, never more than two minutes, say. It's, I, I, and I can feel when it's going to go. I can feel that, when the fade out goes. It does remind me, your description of that reminds me of when you become lucid in a dream and you're trying to hold on to the lucidity of it yeah, and you yeah. kind of um, come out and wake yourself up. Yeah, but, yeah, because for my experience, because my experience is so positive of this syndrome and these, these experiences, um, I, I'd like them to carry on uh, mm. and see if we can get further. Maybe, maybe they will go beyond telling me to be to not to be anxious, and they will really tell me the meaning of life if they could just stay uh, on for another couple of minutes. But it, I can never hold it. Exactly what you're mm. saying in, in terms of a, a lucid dream, or even sometimes you think about a regular dream. You're waking up from it. Oh, I don't want to wake up from this. I know I'm transcending, and but you can't stop it. It's yeah, interesting. So, interesting. I can't remember from the Oliver Sacks book what the kind of neurology was of Charles Bono. What do they say is happening? Do you know brain-wise? They they don't know. That's mm. it's, it's a big. This issue. is this is one of the things, isn't it? You know, when I, I write about hallucinations, you know, the idea is it's again the labelling theory. All we do is we turn around and we label something as being a hallucination. That's right. Then you well, take well, it... can, just to just to strengthen what you're saying there, can I just read out? The standard NHS description okay. of Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's that uh, this is on their website. This is what they tell you. It is. Uh, 
how bad I say. <laughs> it is a condition, sometimes termed visual release hallucinations, experienced by people who are losing or have lost their sight. It involves seeing things which are not really there. <laughs> The hallucinations are most marked in low light or when relaxing and are complicating scenes involving faces, children and wild animals. And that's just about it. So basically, you know, don't worry about it. It's, just all <laughs> it's so irritating, isn't it? It is so <laughs> irritating when they do that. You know, we know, we know that um, you're nothing to worry about. That You know, it's just, we've explained it. It's an hallucination. Yeah. It's just labelling theory. Despite, as Sarah says, knowing nothing about the neurology. But knowing I'm... nothing about the neurology, nothing at all. It's hubris but writ large, isn't it? The easiest thing to kind of pin down because they're clear, it almost sounds a little bit like there's a sort of a synesthetic experience occurring because different um, senses seem entangled in perhaps not a very ordinary way when someone experiences Charles Bonnet syndrome. It makes me think of the the kind of story and the folklore of the blind seers and the fact that people could see and communicate with entities or experience spirit worlds if they had impaired vision. Because, yeah. um, you know, I don't know whether those ideas of like looking into darkness or sensory deprivation to provoke these transcendental experiences are really common. So I can, I can imagine that something similar is occurring with Charles Bono syndrome, where you're somehow compensating for the lack of visual input mm. by creating yeah. visual input. Yeah. But that's the argument, you know, they will turn around and they'll say it happens with people who are partially sighted, because the brain is trying to create visual things to keep it happy but you read the books written say people like richard l gregory one of the world's leading experts on visual systems we don't understand how visual systems work we don't understand how the the inner model from from the retina is then processed into an ex internal image which is this three-dimensional world that surrounds us it's a magic act it's it you know that the pretense that we know how the visual the visual systems work no we don't we don't know how vision works at all we don't know you know for instance the argument about we don't see the blind spot because the brain creates something to fill in the blind spot yeah. so you know we, we need to realize the limits of our own understanding before we start saying that we understand these things because i would again imagine neil you know your experiences you know these things because you're experiencing them and for some smart ass doctor to come along or some expert in raised commas and turn around and say oh it's just an hallucination nothing but, is just anything is it but from their from their reductionist viewpoint they haven't got a choice have they because no. if they admitted that it wasn't hallucination they would have to admit that there is some other form of reality <laughs> mm. and that's not how a reductionist works is it the, you know the, the the term itself um t tells you that so so they've got to do that and mm. you know perhaps being a bit unfair on the nhs but but uh because they do go on to say on the nhs side they do go on to um to, to tell people who have been experiencing this that they're not going insane this is not a psychological issue. This is something to do with your visual loss, and it's it's more common than you might think it is. Well, isn't the central point always about Charles Bonnet syndrome is, as I understand it from my readings, is that it's differentiated because somebody who has Charles Bonnet syndrome is acutely aware of the fact that these things are hallucinations. They never ever think that they are kind of absolute reality. They know that it's an hallucination. And then they start to question, well, what exactly am I seeing here? Yeah. You know, you never confuse it for being something real because Charles Bonnet's, you know, Charles Lewin, who was Charles Bonnet's father or whatever, or uncle, I think it might have been. I can't remember, sure, I'm quite sure. You know, Lolin himself, you know, he used to joke about it. He used to see women with these huge hats on and they'd come into his room and he'd joke about it, <laughs> you know. And as you say, there's almost the delight. Sissy, Siri Husfeld, in her descriptions of her Charles Bonnet syndrome, she used to delight in it. There's one bit where she describes, which I cite in my book, which is extraordinary, where she was sitting writing and then suddenly this little farmer, little tiny man with a cow comes into her room, pulling a cow along with a piece of rope. And he walks into the room 
And he looks at her. And then a little police car appears, comes round the corner. All these little policemen get out and arrest him, dump him into the back of the car and drive out through the room. And she's sitting there just watching this and she's going, this is extraordinary. And she loves it. You know, and she, you know, this is this is the strangest. I, I have to say that that is more exciting than my experiences. I've never, <laughs> I've never had an arrest made by little men. <laughs> by little men. This does really remind me of uh, hypnagogic imagery. And uh, I was talking to Samantha Treasure when we were talking about sleep paralysis, about uh, actually when you fall asleep with your eyes open and the dream gets overlaid on what you're seeing through your what you're able to take in through your eyes. And I think that. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me that with the soft gaze or with the low light and the impaired vision that those that kind of hypnagogic imagery could become much more vivid and i i always you know when i read about charles bonnet syndrome my first kind of knowledge of it was from that oliver sacks book hallucination and um i could just imagine kind of people sitting in old people's home because he specifically goes on about that looking at like a carpet pattern and just losing themselves in a carpet pattern and entering this trance-like state and starting to see um, all sorts of things come out of that because a lot of them are uh, things like costume, epic costume drama scenes from like Cleopatra or something like that, like big peopled epic proportion, a lot of costumes and colorfulness, like it is a, a pleasurable invention almost. It's a, there's a vast range when you when you get into it and you find out that it, it is a little bit more common than most people think. Um, but there's a vast range of experiences that, that, that people go through. And again, we've been talking about uh, obviously about, I've been talking about my experiences and other people's positive experiences. But a lot of people are scared to death by it. And I think perhaps because they're scared, they get the worst images. Mm, like sleep mm. paralysis kind of works in a way, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and so this, so, so, well, this is a good time to talk about the, um, that there's been a recent study by the UC, by UCL and the RNIB about Charles Bonnet syndrome during lockdown and how apparently there's been a massive increase in people um, uh, uh, you know, contacting the RNIB and then USCL did a study and people with Charles Bonnet have been, previously with Charles Bonnet, have been um, reporting increased incidents of it during lockdown. Uh, I, I did... um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I know there was a um, uh, certain eye symptoms associated with coronavirus as well. So I wonder whether that might have impacted it, that people's vision has been impaired um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, this is just a pretty straightforward art. I sent you the article, didn't I, um, Anthony? You did, yes. And it was fascinating reading. And again, this is something that, you know, the idea of lockdown dreams, the idea of people in isolation. Again, you know, Sam Treasure that was mentioned earlier on, Sam has been doing work on this in terms of astronaut dreams. And again, you know, this is very intriguing. Is it, you know, that we, we need stimulation? And the very our very need for the stimulation is drawing this in, you know. And again, just referring back again to um, the uh, the Oliver Sacks book on hallucinations. I mean, all the way through there, he stresses all the time nobody knows what hallucinations are. Yeah. And again, I'm intrigued here where we've got the Charles Bonnet aspect of aural hallucinations again, you know, and the idea that you hear things in some way as well you know and I'm reminded here of the hearing voices network and the things they're doing here I experience that as part of hypnagogia so like, do I yes tell us more Sarah on that uh well you know a lot of what you're saying now really reminds me of the hypnagogic experience mm. and especially if you are you have your eyes open and you're hypnagogic and you see dream scenes overlaying reality but I'll hear like a really loud doorbell or snatches of music or someone calling my name could be anything or, or conversation and it's really really clear as anything um so I, you know i've I, we say all the time don't we that hallucinations actually aren't that weird at all like mm. seeing things isn't that weird the the active imagination has been horribly suppressed by modern culture so that we're no longer familiar with our imaginal realms but actually 
you put someone in a sensory deprivation tank and they'll start seeing stuff pretty quickly because of the sensory deprivation. And actually, when do we ever experience like full darkness? I've got friends that won't mm. even draw their curtains because they're not used to full yeah. darkness. <laughs> yeah. Well, you well, 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 just... I was just going to say here very quickly as a book that if you've not read it, again, a previous guest of this program is Dr. Andreas Mavromatis. And Andreas Mavromatis wrote the definitive book on hypnagogic imagery called Hypnagogia. And I strongly advise anybody who is interested in this phenomenon to beg, steal or borrow a copy of that book because it is extraordinary. And again, he discusses, you know, the, the ectopic in, uh, imagery um, and everything else as well that, that Graham Hancock talks about. You know, there seems to be a definitely links here with scotomas and everything else as well. It's again, there's a massive linkage to be made here um, and his work. And interestingly enough, um, Mavromatis' second book, Travelling Light, is about his experiences as uh, working with a Greek shaman and going into darkness in caves and the island of Poros in Greece and his experiences there with entities when he went into darkness. So again, you know, this is really intriguing. You know, it's, it's, it's how long is a piece of string here? This is very interesting stuff. Sorry, Neil, I butted in there, but I just needed to get in about Mavromatis. Well, I just, this is, this may seem a slightly tenuous link, but I have a nice, I've, I've printed out a couple of quotes in case I could use them. And this kind of links it back to what we've just been talking about and, and the folklore and exactly what Sarah was saying about, you know, your, what are you seeing when you close your eyes? What is, what is that imagery you're seeing, especially in a hypnagogic state? And this is from um, the, you, you know about this, Anthony, W.Y. Evans Vents. Mm, yes. Fairy, fairy faith in Celtic countries in, I think it was published in 1911, um, where he travelled, he was an American, travelled around the, what he called the Celtic countries, you know, Scotland, Ireland, Isle of Man, Wales, Cornwall, Brittany. It's, it's a fascinating book. Um, you know, we, we could go on for another hour, but we, we won't it's go. It's wonderful. It's but great it, fun, isn't it? It's, uh, but it's a pivotal book, I think, in folklore collection. And of course, Evan Vence was the guy that translated the Tibetan Book of yeah. the Dead as well, wasn't he? That's correct. He did that later. He did the, the mm. Very Faith in Celtic Countries was first. Mm. And, uh, 10 years, 12, 15 years later, he did the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But um, he... he it, the, it's so pivotal in folklore collection, especially you know British folklore collection. Before there'd been a tendency, not always, but to collect stories from a long time in the past, almost fairy tales, not not fairy tales, but folklore with uh, allegorical folk folklore. So there might have been some reality to it, but actually, you know, re really. It's been built up over generations and there are tales to it. Evans Vents wanted, he did collect stories from generations ago, but what he really wanted, he wanted to meet the people who were meeting the fairies and had contemporary stories about them. And that changed things. I think from then, in the early 20th century, that became the primary goal of folklore collection. They weren't after the fairy tales. They weren't after the allegory. They were after, um, uh, you know, anecdotal, up-to-date um folklore and just just in you know in light of what we've been talking about this is this is fascinating this is um uh, from uh, an uh, an irish what vents called a clairvoyant um in ross's point in county sligo ireland um and vents wanted to know what the mechanics were of interacting with with, with the fairies he doesn't even talk about what he saw. He's just, you know, how, how, how do you see it? You call yourself a seer or a clairvoyant. How do you do it? And so listen to this carefully, this quote from this guy, um, in terms of what we've just been talking about. I have always made a distinction between pictures seen in the memory of nature and visions of actual beings now existing in the inner world. We can make the same distinction in our world. I may close my eyes and see you as a vivid picture in my memory, or I may look at you with my physical eyes and see your actual image. In seeing these beings, the fairies, of which I speak, the physical eyes may be open or closed. Mystical beings in their own world and nature are never seen with the physical eyes. Isn't that good? Mm. <laughs> 
Totally. And, and of course, one of the things that I'm intrigued about is the inner vision, you know, yes. and the idea of biophotons. And funnily enough, one of the, the major researchers in this area was Fritz Alec, uh, Fritz Pop, P-O-P-P, who was a researcher at the University of Liverpool. And, you know, the whole idea of biophotons and, in you know, the light that's generated internally mm. that, that illuminates these scenarios. I think there's there's a lot of area of interest here. And I remember I, I really picked up on that quote as well when I read the Evans Vent stuff, because I thought that is extraordinary, isn't yeah. it? You know, and how deep he was going into this. Um, yeah, so how is go on you were going to say something sorry oh, well it, it just um you know you meet several people like this especially in ireland uh, mm. and scotland and he, he, obviously this is pre-first world war much more rural community but these people you get the distinct impression impression they're not uh they're not charlatans they're not lying this there's, there's 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 no chicanery going on these people Mm. have some form whatever you want to call it clairvoyance second sight and part of that is being able to interact at whatever level with entities such as in this case the fairies do you, and, this, um, do you think this has something to do with that kind of deep embedding within nature that we've lost because i think you know one of the things that i really take away from this is you talking about the nature spirits and in ancient greece and ancient egypt there's this worship of natural forces and this recognition of nature having a life and being divine which yeah. we've lost contact with and with those people living in rural communities they still live and breathe by the rhythms and the cycles of nature and so they're much more sensitive to the spirits and the energies of nature and they have a much deeper respect for it and they they you know, I, I know myself when i've like lived in natural surroundings and being in constant contact with the sea or the elements you you recognize there's a language there in nature and i think these people can understand that language yeah what you were talking about in ireland reminded me of i think it's in russia um, I read an article about these women that can um, construct oracles out of listening to water sources and they hear the murmur of water and it speaks to them and they're able to tell fortunes from reading and listening to this water. And I think that, you know, in all of nature presents this pattern to us and we are actually um, part of that pattern and we should be recognising it, but because we've become... Um, you know, creatures of technology and we've become separate from nature. We don't necessarily recognize the patterns. And maybe DMT is like this um, shooting straight into the fabric of nature again, because DMT is in all natural plants and in, in living things. And maybe it's just like a high concentrated dose of nature. Well, it was interesting, wasn't it, that um, when we, we chatted with Kaz, Kaz Coronel, and one of the things that always intrigues me is when when cows used to message me to say, you know, she'd go out walking and she wouldn't wear any shoes and she'd just be her feet in contact with the ground. And the idea, again, being in contact with the telluric forces or whatever it is. But we are always divorced from that reality, aren't we? I always think, you know, all you need to do is to spend one night under the stars. And suddenly you will realise that there is a whole world out there that we are we are insulated from. And it doesn't mean it's not real, you know, it just means we don't experience it. And I think your point that, you know, more traditional societies or more rural societies are more in tune with this and they pick it up. And if we all create our own reality, if we're only if we're all in some way collapsing the wave function of our expectations, which is going to be the theme of my new book, Welcome to the Universe. This is what it is. You know, you know, when people have great religious beliefs, it's because their world and the things they see reinforce those beliefs in everything they see. Yeah. Whereas, you know, somebody who's a materialist reductionist will not see these things because, you know, it's a kind of a, a super saper wolf hypothesis that their whole worldview is is predicated on what they believe in. Yeah. You know, and as soon as those belief systems are worn down, suddenly the doors of perception are open and everything comes through, doesn't it? You know, and it... It's very intriguing. This has been absolutely fascinating. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of your other um, Charles Bonnet experiences, you know, and, and how they've panned out? Well, this, is, this, this does take it to another level. <laughs> that sounds good for me. <laughs> 
can we take it anymore interesting yeah, well, well, well this is uh, again when I, when I first, let me just step back a moment and, and when, when this first started happening obviously I already knew about psychedelics I'd already um, done the, the meditation and entity uh, experiences that we talked about but when the Charles Bonnet started in 2016 I, I didn't mention it to anyone I, it took me years to talk the first uh, I can't remember the first time I, I talked about it, it to anyone in any detail but I just couldn't bring myself to, to talk about it because you can imagine the raised eyebrows of some people either raised eyebrows or right we're taking you down the psycho psychiatric ward um but now but now in the last few years it's like you know what the heck what you just you know it, this is how it is I know I, I know I'm not going insane I know it's not a psychiatric condition let's just look a little bit deeper as hopefully we have done today um now but <laughs> I haven't talked to anyone except uh, our mutual friend Samantha uh, about this, which started to happen just before Christmas. And it's definitely some kind of Charles Bonnet related system because the kaleidoscope effect is there. So um, I have a, a backyard and it's west facing. And just before Christmas, um, uh, I, I should say the Charles Bonnet experiences to me always happen inside. It's what never, it's never happened outside. It's always inside and it's always at night. And I'm always on my own. Those are absolutes. Those are, those are, um, that, that's what happens every time. So uh, before Christmas, I'm standing outside of my back door, looking out to the, the night sky, the early night sky, about six o'clock in the evening. And I see the kaleidoscope effect in the sky, which is the first and right that's that's unusual because that looks as though it's miles away whereas of course if i'm in my living room it's just a few feet away that's interesting that's all right and then it fades and then it goes and then and this i think this might have been christmas eve maybe just before 23rd or 24th of december it happened again in a clear clear sky and after it faded, there was a star, a pinpoint star left there. And my eyesight allows me to see stars, anything with good contrast. I can sit so I can see stars in the, in the, in the night sky. And this is a faint star. And of course, it starts to move. Um, rationalist head on immediately. Plane, satellite, um, drone, helicopter. Must be one of those four things. Can't be a plane or a... Or, or a satellite because it's starting to zigzag can't be a helicopter it's too far away and it's moving too quickly same goes for a drone and none helicopters or drones do not move the way this is moving like streaking across the sky zigzagging horizontal um, vertical and so as i'm watching it still trying to rationalize it still trying to think right is this actually in my eye am i am i having some sort of light that's reflecting and of course you move your eye and this thing still carries on its you know, on its route so it's not on my eye it's something there in the sky which has appeared after that kaleidoscope effect that i usually get with charles bono syndrome in interior experiences um a minute this goes on for a minute moving across the sky from one side to the other sometimes extremely fast sometimes stopping and then just fizzling out and gone um yeah what what do you make of it what what do i what 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 do i make of it i i i don't know what to make of it and this is happening now this happens regularly this, yeah, if there's a clear sky and uh, just just sorry just uh, it, mm. it, this only happens if there's a clear sky if there's cloud cover it doesn't happen which suggests that whatever it is is in the sky and i'm uh, and, and and i'm witnessing it and I, I have to say that after half a dozen you know six seven eight times of this happening every time i go out into my yard at night and look up i'm now expecting to see it and it happens every single time i can all it's almost as though i'm invoking it and i know that's uh, another another level of sort of crazy sounding but uh 
that's what it feels like. What I do with the information, I don't know. Do you know how extraordinary this is? It is is weird beyond belief here that you are describing that phenomenon and you're on the Wirral, okay, or on the Wirral Peninsula or Wirral. The whole events of my mother and her experiences and the Charles Bonnet syndrome started when she was looking into the sky on the Wirral and she described to me what she said was she described it as almost a smoke ring or something moving in the sky that was obscuring the sky, the sky behind or the clouds behind and it was rotating and she said it was rotating and it was shimmering and then it sort of started to to, to scintillate and then it it, it 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 then shot off towards north wales so she was looking towards where you live looking towards wallasey from bromborough and bevington she then said it shot off towards North Wales, towards the D side of the Wirral. Now, the intriguing thing about this is that, again, I thought this was something she was seeing in the sky that wasn't, was, was, was part of her developing Charles Bonnet syndrome. And that night she had the, the incident with the grey, which I've discussed many times and won't go into detail about this. But what was fascinating about that, that particular incident, was that... I was subsequently contacted by a mutual friend of mine, or a friend of mine, there's a mutual friend of mine, a friend of mine, Richard Fleming, and his, she's a friend of his, a lady called Morrigan Hawkins. And Morrigan was, and you'll know this if you know the Wirral, she was on the White Bridge, the A41, Newchester Road, and she was going across the White Bridge by Port Sunlight on the very evening that my mother saw this thing. And she said everybody on the bus saw it. Because they saw something over Price's factory or the old Price's factory, Bromborough Dock, and it shot over the bus going towards North Wales. And they all went, what on earth was that? Mm. So what have we got here? We've got something that seems to project outwards. It's almost the kind of the Jungian idea of, you know, a modern myth of things seen in the sky. Yeah. So it's a kind of projection of our minds, but it's also out there, isn't it? Well, it's... It, I, I... I, find, I, I still haven't quite come to terms. That's that's possible, but it's, uh, I haven't come to terms with what this means. The mm. best I've come up with is that in in my writings, I make I, I, I sort of take the Graham Hancock line that fairies and aliens. There's a lot of similarities between mm. the two, and maybe whatever they are they're giving me a message <laughs> what yeah. the, the way it fit the, the, the reason it feels like a message is that i know that i can go out and if it's a clear sky i know now i just know it's going to happen and sure enough it hasn't let me down once um it's even got to the stage where i've gone outside and purposely not looked up because oh, i don't know what to do with this information anymore um and that's a so maybe maybe it's it's something external sending a message to me about what i'm writing about about the other entities about um uh, fairies agorials whatever you want to call them they're actually all the same they're it's all probably, they're all huh? i was going to say it's probably valis <laughs> if you know of the concept of valis valis uh, philip k dick yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, 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 hey, <laughs> no, we're not going there today, Anthony, no way. But it's a, and, and well, you're talking about synchronicities, you're talking about your mum and what I've just talked about. So, the after I think after the second time I saw this, um, I, there's a chat. Have, have you heard of Michael Grosso? Yes, Michael Grosso, a very good writer. He's um, mm. he writes, um, what was it? Joseph of Corpatino, the the guy, the yeah, monk, the guy, the, the monk that flew, yeah, the great levitating monk. Yeah, he's, he's written a book about. He's written. He's an he's, he's an academic in Canada, I think, mm, mm. and he he has um, a, a blog that he puts out called Consciousness Unbounded. Uh, it's very good. It's, it's you know he's, okay. he's, he's a very um, articulate writer. And the, after the second time that I saw this, he described it in a, in a blog post exactly the same. The light, the way it moved, it came out of something. He described it as smoky um, but rather than kaleidoscope. But that was the other exactly. description my mum made was smoke. Yeah, yeah. And, and and he's describing this light, this faint pinpoint of light moving totally erratically around for about a minute and then popping out of existence. And and 
and he wrote in, in that blog that he, he'd seen that two or three times. And that was like two days after I'd seen exactly that thing and was trying to make sense of it. Uh, again, I don't know what that means, if it means anything, but it's uh, that kind of synchronicity should probably not be ignored. No, it should not be. I think a lot of the things that we are experienced, that we are describing on this podcast, I genuinely believe this podcast is of profound significance because what we're doing is we're being... Guests like you are giving us information that when people look back on this podcast in years to come, they will say that these were the guys that were putting it together. These were the guys that were really pushing the envelope and and intellectualizing and thinking deeply about it. Because, I mean, for instance, you discussing here about David Luke, and David Luke is my next guest on Consciousness Hour uh, uh, a week on Sunday, where we'll be talking about his research at the moment in terms of DMT and, and other areas as well. So all the people we talk about are all on the periphery of this group. Yeah. And it, to me, this is this has got to be significant. And I don't know quite what it is. You know, it's again this the analogy I've used so many times. We've got this jigsaw puzzle and we've got all the pieces on the table. And all we need to do is all get together when the lockdown finishes and look at the jigsaw puzzle pieces, have a conference and really pull this together because we've got the clues. Yeah. We, I, we... I, I, think, I don't think that jigsaw is supposed to be easy. No. It's supposed to be a very difficult jigsaw. Um, no, absolutely. And is it because... Like one of the baked beans. Can't really tell where anything belongs. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the terrible jigsaw puzzle of the baked beans. Because really, you know, it's, if we are, if we are, collect, you know, I would argue that we are creating our own egregore here. Our group is creating an egregore. And whether the rest of the world is going to see the world as we do is beside the point, because we are collectively collapsing our own wave function of this reality that we're creating at the moment. Neil, that was absolutely extraordinary. I cannot even begin to say how wonderful the last two hours has been. It, it's been, abs and I've been looking at the comments that have been that have been flying in on, on on people making comments, and it's been it's been fantastic. And I am sure that when people when we put this up on my YouTube channel, the amount of people that are going to be wanting to 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 watch this again, because the things you've said are extraordinary. And may I thank you for sharing these with us, because I know that you had certain reservations about this, but this has been an extraordinary show and augurs so well for the future. Um, all I can say is next time I'm up on the world, we, we've got to go meet up and have a few beers and continue talking about this. And somebody else that I must put you in contact with is Dr. Alan Roberts, um, who lives in Heswell. Okay. You need to talk to him. Okay. Uh, you really do. I'll facilitate that for you. Um, but anyway, so thanks. Is there any final points you want to make, either of you, in terms of any contacts and, and everything well, else? Um, uh, well, we, we didn't talk about this at all, but I have published a novel this year. Yes, which I've so, published. So yeah. it's called Dead But Dreaming. Um, that's my second novel. It was published, not this year, it was published last year in, in, in July. Uh, it's doing pretty well. And... Uh, there's, there's lots of fairies in it. There's lots of altered states of consciousness and quite a bit of discussion about solipsism. So covering uh, you know, a lot of what we've covered today. Are, are in so where can people get that book on Amazon and everything? The usual, the usual, yeah, Amazon. The, the evil empire of Amazon, you know, you just have to you know, get, get, go along with that. But it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, so you, can get, so you can get that anywhere. And I'm still, I find it quite difficult creative writing during lockdown. I've, I've been off the boil for the last few months, but hopefully I'll be publishing a few more pieces on my blog site, which is dead, but dreaming. Okay. Um, so, and anyone who wants to contact me and find me there can, can, can do so. Please do because you know, your work is, is extraordinary and incredibly important because it's experiential as well. And sir, a final point, anybody wants to, to contact you on your website and your little group as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say to Neil, like, I really loved that. And it's a lot of my similar interests. I think that the work that you're doing and your interests really important avenue to explore. And I, I think that it's interesting you were saying when you started to have symptoms of Charles Bonnet syndrome that you didn't know what it was. And maybe someone watching this will be more confident and happy to realize that this is something that a lot of people do experience. So that was great. Um, and my website is just themysteries.org. 
Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much for listening in and spending another two over two hours with us on this um, very spring-like um, afternoon on a Monday. Um, so thanks very much, folks, and we'll see you again next week. Um, looking forward to it. Okay, thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Okay, bye. <laughs>